Welcome to the podcast about communication for business leaders. I'm your host, George Torok. I'm known as the speech coach for executives because I help business leaders improve their intended message and get it delivered successfully. I do that through one-on-one coaching and training for the team. Today, it's a solo show, and we're going to look at how you can use stories more effectively in your communication. First question is, do you have some stories, some great stories that you use regularly? And you might say, no, nothing happens to me in my life. There's nothing going on. Well, you know what? The stories don't have to be about climbing Mount Everest or winning a gold medal. They can be about simple everyday things. And today I'm going to take a look specifically at two stories that I use, and then we'll go back and break it down, and I'll demonstrate to you how you can put together your stories using the techniques to build a better, stronger story, how to find stories, and how to use it. The first story is one that I use in my training sessions when I'm training people on presentation skills. This is the opening story. Would it surprise you to hear that the president of the company wasn't doing his job? What was he doing wrong? Now, this president had built this company from nothing to one that was now doing about $50 million a year in sales. And the way they got their sales was a two-stage process. And at this point, his most important job was to bring in new business. And the two-part process worked like this. In the first stage, they would submit a written proposal in response to a request for proposal. And they would almost always pass that first stage. They'd get past the written document stage. Now, if they do that, they win every time. They get past that first stage, the written document. And in the written document is all the detail, all the information that the people want to analyze. It'll have the process, the team that'll work on there, all the prices, all the options, everything that anyone would need to make a logical decision about working with this company. The second stage of the selection process was for the president to come and deliver a presentation to a committee. Now, you might ask yourself, if they already have everything they need on writing, why do they want the president to come and speak to them? What are they going to learn new? What are they looking for? Well, think about it. And in this process, it's a clever process because it addresses how we make decisions. We make decisions both logically and emotionally. They're both important to the decision. So the first stage, the written document stage, is a logical decision. And now we need to make an emotional decision. We want to see the president in person. We want to get a feel for what he's like, his character, his personality. Can we trust this person if we're going to be working with them? Well, at one point, the president was passing the second stage. They were getting deals. But then he ran into a lull in business where he was losing at the presentation stage. His presentations were getting stale and they weren't liking him anymore. (laughs) So he wasn't winning. Another contract coming up for a $10 million project. He wanted to win this time, so he called me in to coach him on his presentation. When I met him, I found out he was already a strong, strong presenter and full of confidence. Lack of confidence wasn't an issue for him. In fact, he might have said that maybe he had a little bit too much confidence. Well, I spent three days with him, and we worked on the presentation from scratch. We rebuilt it, and then I helped him improve his delivery. On the fourth day, he flew down to Washington, D.C., where he was delivering his next presentation for this $10 million project. 
At the end of the day, he called me and he said, George, we got the deal. Ten million dollars. And it grew into seventeen million. And darn for me, I didn't charge commission, just a flat fee. There were three changes that that president made to his presentation that were all significant. And here are the three changes that you can use in your presentation. One, he said less. We took what was originally a 60-minute rambling presentation and chopped it down to 12 minutes. 12 minutes! Can you imagine that? $10 million on the line and you're going to give them your best 12 minutes? There was nothing magical about the number 12. It's just as we were building the presentation and we got to that point, I realized that's all he needed. 12 minutes is all he needed. Why did he prepare a 60-minute presentation? Because they said, you've got 60 minutes. (laughs) doesn't mean that you, you need to fill it. And in fact, imagine all the other bidders probably all using their 60 minutes, maybe even going overtime, 70 minutes. And then this person stands up and delivers his presentation in 12 minutes. Can you imagine the impact that would have had on this selection committee? And it turns out they spent the rest of the 60 minutes asking him questions, so now he's not selling. They're having a conversation with him, much more convincing. The second change he made, this was a significant change for this person. He was a strong A-type personality. We changed his perspective. Instead of him coming there and talking about how great his company was, the awards they won, the project they worked on, the great customers that they worked on, and what a great team they were, and what a great leader he was, we got him to talk about what was important to the client. What was their perspective? What were they willing to spend this $10 million on? So now... He wasn't there to sell. He was there to talk about their project, and it turned out it was a legacy project. So now he's there to be part of their team and help them champion their cause. What a difference that is, talking about them and their perspective instead about him and selling himself. Big change. And the third change that he made was he included a personal story short personal story in a 12-minute speech. The story was only about 45 seconds. And it was a personal story. It was a story about advice that when he was a little boy, advice that he got from his grandfather. And we'll come back to that. Three changes he made to his presentation. He said less, which made it easier to listen to, and be more conversational. He changed his perspective so that they they knew that he was wanting to understand them. And three, a short personal story. He got the project, $10 million project, turned into $17 million. Now, why is that a good story? Well, there are a few reasons. One, I tell that story at the beginning of my training sessions, One, to to grab their attention right away. Also to demonstrate the success of the program. And it's not about me being the hero. It's about my client who I helped become the hero. And here's the first lesson. When you tell stories about yourself, don't make yourself the hero all the time. Occasionally, maybe, but not all the time, because then you sound self-centered and it's hard to connect with you. And if you, if you talk about how perfect you are, we hate you, because no one can be that perfect all the time. We want to see a flaw. And so it's okay when you tell a personal story, there's a chance to reveal a flaw. It doesn't have to be a major flaw, but it's okay to use a flaw because that's how we connect with the audience. Now, let's go back through this story and look at some of the changes and the reason why the parts are there. Let's start with the beginning. My opening statement is, 
would it prize you to hear that the president of the company wasn't doing his job? Think about why is that a good opening? Well, it's a good opening because, one, it's a question, and the question a question's engaged, so it's a good way to start. Why would it surprise you? And then the news that the president of the company wasn't doing his job. And that's even more interesting for business leaders because, hmm, why is that president not doing his job? And, gee, I hope that I'm not making those mistakes, too. So there's a way to get into the story quickly. And the, and the wrong way to stay is, well, let me tell you about the time, or I'm going to tell you the story about it. See, that's boring. It doesn't grab the attention. And when I first started telling the story, here's how I told it. I said, I helped the company president close a $10 million deal. That's a lousy opening. Why is that a lousy opening? One, because it's about me. It's about me bragging and the tension is gone. I just told the whole story in that statement, so there's no reason to listen to the rest. So I changed that and said, would it surprise you to learn? Notice how less that is about me and how it's more interesting to the audience. So make your opening, grab, grab them with your opening question or bold statement. There's three parts to a story, a, a good story for business. And the three parts are, one is the setup. This is the longest part, and this is what helps create the scene and sets the tension. Two is the pivot, the pivot point where the tension is relieved, where the aha. Uh -huh. And three is the point to the story. You don't tell a story for telling a story. No, unless you're telling it, of course, to kids. But when you're telling a story in business, you're telling it to make a point. There's a lesson, there's a point, and the story helps people remember the point. So the three parts, the first part is the setup where I describe the situation and how I worked with the president. And then the tension, the pivot, is when he calls me to tell me that he got the deal. And the point is... And, and there's three points to, to this story is one is when you're delivering a presentation, say less. Two, talk from the perspective of your audience. And three, use personal stories. So there's a story that I use and there are the pieces, how they fit together. And there you can take some ideas for your own stories. Let's take a look. At another story that's different. That this, this story is a personal story, my personal story that I use. And it goes like this. I have three children, and when they were young, they all played soccer. And I enjoyed watching them play soccer and taking them to the games and the practices. And I probably have watched hundreds of soccer games <laughs> over the years. Yet one stands out the most for me in my memory. It's when my son, Chris, was seven years old, just started playing mini soccer. And that's where they play on a much smaller field. And the goals are, uh, the goals are marked by those orange traffic cones. And they're set about maybe six feet apart. I remember this one game. And when you, watch, when you watch them playing, the kids, especially in mini soccer, they're right in the beginning, they haven't figured out tactics. They haven't figured out teamwork. So when you're watching the game, you know where the ball is all the time, even though you can't see it. It's inside of that cluster of kids that just move erratically around the field, and you know the ball's in there somewhere. Once in a while, it comes out. Well, this one game I'm watching, and there's the cluster around the ball, and then I noticed my son, Chris, was standing away from the cluster. And I thought, oh, I guess my coaching him paid off. He's listening. He's in position for a pass. Then the ball escaped from the cluster and was rolling towards Chris. I'm on the sideline. Chris, get the ball. Chris, get the ball. Get, get the, the ball, Chris, and kick it at the net. Go, go, go. However, Christopher wasn't looking at the ball. He was staring 
up into the sky. Chris, get the ball, Christopher, get the ball, get the ball. I'm going crazy on the sideline. And then a strange thing happened. Every child on the field stopped running and just gazed up into the sky. Well, at this point, I'm wondering, what the heck is up there? Is it the mothership? So I looked up, and then there was the most beautiful rainbow I've ever seen, and it was resplendent in the full spectrum of colors that went all the way from one horizon to the other. Now, the referee was smart. He blew his whistle and said, one minute to look at the rainbow. And everyone watched and enjoyed the sight of this rainbow for one minute. Then the referee tweaked, blew the whistle again, play on. And the game played on after that. Now, I don't remember who won that game. I don't remember what the score was. I don't even remember if Chris even had a shot at the net. But I remember the rainbow. So there's, a different, there's an example of an entirely different kind of story. It's not a business story. However, there are lessons from it. What could be the possible lessons? That story could have more than one point. And many of your stories could have more than one point. That's why some of them, when you get a really good story, you can use it in more than one situation. What could be the point of that story? Well, the point could be, well, in a busy world, sometimes we just need to slow down and enjoy the rainbow. Or it could be that sometimes we're so focused on the details that we miss the bigger picture. Or sometimes we can learn from our children possible points to that story. Why does that story work so well? I told that first time I told that story to a group of executives, and it, and it was a, a virtual presentation, the, the head of the organization called me immediately after, and he'd, he's heard me speak many times before, and he said, George, that story was terrific. And I thought, oh, okay. Now, why is that story good? Well, it has two elements that make a story effective. One, it has visuals, and two, it has touches emotions. My question to you is, when I was telling the story, could you see me on the sideline going nuts? When I described the children on the field that clustered around the soccer ball, could you see that image? And did you see the rainbow? And did you feel beauty? of that moment and that rainbow. That's what you want your best stories to do, is to plant visuals in the mind of your listeners and touch their emotions. So there's an example of a personal story, and those are stories that are easier to find in your life. It's just the little things, the incidents that go on that are curious, that are memorable, could be embarrassing, could be funny. And kids make a great story. When you talk, when you tell a story about your family, people listen up because it makes you feel more human to them. Because we all have family and we have strong feelings about family, some of them positive, some of them negative, but they're strong feelings. So when you talk about family, we listen up and we relate to you, we see you as a human that maybe we can trust. So there's some uses of stories. And over the past few years on this podcast, there have been several guests who have talked about stories. I encourage you to look for some of them. And here are five that stood out for me, five of those guests. Graham Brown talked about the three-box story technique. Three-box story technique from Graham B Brown. That was episode originally 68, number 68, Graham Brown. Bruce Shear. Bruce wrote a book and talked about how to inspire your buyers with the right narrative, finding stories to help you sell. That's Bruce Shear in episode 171. Richard Rosser. Richard Rosser um, is, works in Hollywood, and he talked about how 
to use AI to enhance your story for ideas. Not to change it, but just to enhance it, make it better. Richard Rosser in episode 170. Alan McLaren. Alan McLaren talked about using stories, how leaders can tell stories to build their own brand, their personal leadership brand and their business brand. That's leadership branding stories from Alan McLaren on episode 108. And fifth here is Robert Ty. Robert talked about how to find and tell your origin story, your origin story from Robert T- Ty. And that was episode 91. And origin stories are a powerful story to have because we like to hear, how did you get here? How did you get here? Why did you start this? Why did you go in this direction? How did you start this business? How did you start this career? We love to hear origin stories. So there, those are five guests who've talked about stories on Your Intended Message podcast. I encourage you to listen to them. With that, go out there, look for your stories, put them into use, and when you're looking for more ideas, be sure to listen in on the podcast. I'm your host, George Torok. And talk to you again on your intended message.